do the birds say? Part one, tragedy at Homewood. And I want to fly, I want, I want to fly. And I want to fly. Mommy! Florence, dear, what's happened? Murderer! What is going on here? Clinton killed her! I'm sorry, Flo. I didn't mean to. Oh, oh, I see. My cubby! Poor little cat. It was an accident. <laughs> Florence, Clinton didn't mean to. The trap was set for the gray fox, not for Cubby. Poor gray fox! Clinton, take Cubby away, please. I shall stuff her for you, Flo, so you shall have her forever. I hate you! I shall never forgive you! Florence, Augusta, Miriam. Sorry, Flo. Florence. You will forgive your brother, and we shall speak of this no more. John! I need to stop here and clarify. The year is 1869. I am six years old. We are on our family estate, Homewood, in New York, with its extensive hilltop woods. My father, a New York congressman and self-proclaimed outdoor enthusiast, encourages us children to engage with nature. Naturally, I'm flying. My 13-year-old brother is trapping animals and stuffing them. In his defense, Clinton is not a sadist or murderer by nature. In fact, he will become founder of the National Geographic Society. And yet, murder he did. <laughs> Come in. Enter Uncle John. Florence Lass. By divine providence, Uncle John is paying us a rare visit. He lives in the faraway kingdom of out west. What's happened? Uncle John, Clinton killed my cubby and he's going to stuff her. Oh no, yes, and he was trying to murder the gray fox. He follows in a fashion, doesn't he? It's a bad fashion, what fashion? Tis the fashion of men to dominate their fellow creatures. The so-called man of science thinks he must kill a thing to understand it. Examine its lifeless bits, categorize it, stuff it, and display it behind cabinet glass. Oh, oh, forgive me, Bairn. It's not a proper way to get to know your neighbor, is what I'm trying to say. <gasps> Look! Cardinal, isn't he brilliant? We don't see them out west in Yosemite. Why not? It's not their home. The bright red is the male. You see his crown and wee black mask. Now, where's the other? What other? His mate. They always travel in pairs. If you see the one, you're sure to... Oh, there she is. Where? You see the brownish one? with the same red-orange beak and wee black mask. She has a wee crown, too. Aye. Her colors are more subdued, but her song is more complex. She's not just brown. There is blush upon her crown and the tips of her wings and tail. That's well observed. Thank you. How would you get to know your neighbor, eh? I'd invite her to my house. Grand idea. And maybe I'd fly to her house. She fly. I fly about all the time. It's true. I soar with a peregrine falcon. I ride the Earth's magnetic fields. I'm not joking. We are creatures of imagination and empathy. We get to know our marvelous fellow creatures on this magnificent earth by entering their world. Out west where I live, there's a primeval forest. 
It took more than 3,000 years to make some of the trees. Redwoods are still standing in perfect strength and beauty. Sunshine flowing into them like radiance into a cathedral. It makes you hush so you can listen. What do the birds say? Here I am, here I am. Where are you? Where are you? They sing their joys all the day. Sometimes they cry out together to scare away a predator and keep their bairn from harm. Very brave they are. A choir of birds greets the sun each morning and sings again at nightfall to bed the day farewell. And then the great grey owl hoots in the moonlight. Woo! Woo! Does he scare you? No. Sometimes I'm in his line of vision and we see each other. I'm part of his world. And oh, lass, it's delicious. You don't eat him? Of course not, silly goose. It's the feeling I'm speaking of, the connection. He's telling me that I am part of nature too. I too may live in the forest, sleep beneath the stars. Can I sleep beneath the stars? Of course you can. I'm certain you shall. Can we fly to the bird's home now in the woods? Hey. Can Clinton come too? Opera glasses made in Paris, France. A gift from Mummy when I was six. John Muir was visiting that day and he told her that I was a keen observer of birds. That evening she pressed these into my wee hands and said, This is for your field work. Forgive your brother. The brass felt wonderfully serious, and the double barrels of iridescent mother of pearl, akin to feathers and bird's eggs and clouds, and it brought all of those wonderful birdy things into clearer view. Ravens. Oh, part two, killer fashion. California quail. Scissor tailed flycatcher. Blue jay. You may have rightly guessed we are not in a forest or wood, but on a city street where ladies shop and promenade, displaying the latest fashions yellow warbler. But these birds are not filling the air with joyful tune. They are lifeless remains. Feathers, heads, entire bodies reduced to ornamentation on ladies' hats. Hummingbirds. Raven! Murderers! Did I say that out loud? Female protesters have also taken to the streets. They are armed with megaphones and pamphlets and the truth. I admire them so. Five million birds are being slaughtered worldwide every year. Five million a year? Shocking, isn't it? Say, aren't you attending Smith? I am. Music major, you always have that opera glass about you. No, um, social work. I'm a bird enthusiast. She who goes afield armed with an opera glass adds more to our knowledge than he who goes armed with a gun. <laughs> Say, that's good. You should write a book. Fanny Percy Hardy, second year. Florence Augusta Miriam, freshman. I've written an article for the bird lore, the journal of the Audubon Society for the Protection of Birds. Exactly. I've been thinking... Smith College should have its own chapter of I'm in, let's 
do it. Let's do it. It's a grand idea. Our enlightened sisters at Smith are not entirely immune to the pull of the plume. Might be a good influence. Five million... I can't seem to give these away. It might be fun. All right. Feathers are unfortunately fetching. I confess I own an ostrich plume fascinator. I don't wear it out anymore, of course. Well, technically, the plumes are acquired from the live African ostrich. The birds aren't killed. This is why I adore you. I may sneak a peek in the privacy of my own mirror. <laughs> no, that's a slippery slope. I can't imagine it's very pleasant having one's plumes extracted. No, the birds must be protected. Oh, are you all right? A pair of cardinals. Oh, come on! I love your hat, except for the dead bits. Honestly. Five million birds! Going once, going twice. We are an admirable lot, but I do sometimes wish we could employ a more persuasive persuasion. We can. <laughs> we won't say too much about hats. We'll take the girls afield, let them get acquainted with the birds, then of inborn empathy. They shall wear feathers nevermore. Florence, that's genius. It's a marvelous scheme. I've devised a system for identifying and locating the birds. Only four things are necessary to do the work. A scrupulous conscience, unlimited patience, a notebook, and an opera glass. <laughs> you are a serious birdie girl. I am. I'm not mocking you. I think you're splendid, and I'm very happy to make your acquaintance. Thank you. But might I suggest, on our first trip afield with the girls, we simply go armed with joy? <laughs> Come on, girls. Come out under the sun-filled heavens and open your soul to the song of the lark. When going to watch birds, proceed to some good birdie place, the bushy bank of a stream or an old juniper pasture, and sit down in the undergrowth or against a concealing tree trunk with your back to the sun to look and listen in silence. Part three, magnetic fields. I don't remember it, of course, but I was born during the Civil War and I lived to celebrate the end of World War II. Wild bookends, right? Dear Fanny and I did our bird work wearing corsets and then I spent like the last 20 years of my life basically living in pants because I was trekking around the country camping with my husband, Vernon Bailey, doing our bird work, sleeping beneath the stars, as Uncle John predicted. Our last camping trip, excuse me? Clinton, dear, what is it? I need to clarify something. All right. I did not stuff the cat. No, dear, you did not. And you did forgive me. I did, you know I did. My sister wrote the first bird-watching field guide, Birds Through an Opera Glass. She was awarded the prestigious Brewster Medal for her contributions to ornithological literature and a California mountain chickadee, Perus gambale bailei, is named in her honor. That's very kind. It's not kind, these are facts. The volume and scope of her work led directly to the Lacey Act, 
the first federal law protecting wildlife, and to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918, which saved millions upon millions of endangered birds worldwide. Clinton. Florence Merriam Bailey defined modern bird watching by encouraging the observation of birds in their natural habitat rather than killing them and examining their lifeless skins, as was the fashion. Are you still atoning for Cubby? No. Did you tell them I introduced you to your husband? And I'm so grateful. We were a perfect and inseparable pairing, Mr. Bailey and I. Like Uncle John's Cardinals. Our last camping trip was to upstate New York to search for the Northern Lights. He was 78. Of course I forgave you, and you forgave me. Why in the world would you need my forgiveness? I was cruel. You were six. Your anger woke me up. Hello, fellow travelers. You know, they navigate by Earth's magnetism. Mm-hmm. Can I ride magnetic fields with you? The aurora borealis is caused by magnetism at the Earth's poles. I know. Isn't it mysterious? Not really. So did you see them? The northern lights? We fancied we did. We felt them more than saw them. Weak magnetic fields emanate from our organs, like the brain, the lungs, the heart. Are you serious? Ooh.